Hey, y'all. I'm excited about this week's episode. This is the first elk hunting episode for the fall of 2019. The other thing I'm excited about is we gave this episode a little bit of a different twist. This episode's put together specifically for the person who's new to elk hunting. They've never killed an elk before. Maybe this is their first time going out west. Jordan and I are both still very new to elk hunting. We've been blessed to hunt with a lot of people. They've been doing it for a long time and actually know what they're doing out there, but we're still green. Jordan's actually going after his first archery elk this year. I've only killed one archery elk myself, so we've gotten to be in on a lot of kills just through filming, but we're still learning. We're still very new to it. So I think from our experiences and the wide variety of things we've learned from watching guys like Will, Brad, and Troy in the elk woods, we can give you, the new elk hunter, a real good idea of what you need to do what you need to have with you in order to be successful. We break down everything from what we have in our packs, our bow vest, our bow setups, to even learning how to prepare for when that bull's making his way in the bow range. I'm proud of this episode. I think there's a lot of good information there. I think you'll enjoy it. And lastly, I hope you're enjoying this podcast. If you are, do us a favor, head on over to iTunes, give us a rating, and write us a review. Enjoy the show. And we're rolling. Cool. Jordan? Hello. Um... So last week we were talking about kind of staging up for whitetail season. Yeah. And um, that kind of, they don't go hand in hand, but the time of year does kind of coincide because we're also slipping up very, very – we'll slip up on September a lot quicker than we will October. We are fishing to get busy. Busy, busy. Start mm-hmm. next week. But what does coincide, like I said, the timing of it is with the, the way that it works out and it, it does for a lot of people – you got to kind of start thinking about whitetails and elk season. Yeah. So that's the whole point of this week and is elk season. And um, not just that, I kind of want to talk specifically to – I know you probably hear it too. We get messages messages about it on the Facebook and Instagram and all that, people mm-hmm. asking, just curious because they're going on maybe their first ever elk hunt or they haven't been much at all, pretty much very, very new to it. You know, and they're maybe from the southeast or basically anywhere where there's not elk. Yeah, and there's, they, a, there's a lot of area in this country that doesn't have elk. Right, and there's 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 honestly, man, there's you know there's a fair amount of people too that live fairly close to elk and still haven't gone after them before. Yeah. You know, and so there's the their first time doing it, and so they just kind of have questions. You know, what do I do? And so I thought it would be a good idea. Uh, for us to talk this over specifically um, and we're going to do more this is another kind of a thing to add in we're going to do some more elk episodes in the future uh, in the near future but I did the, wanted to do this one specifically with you and I because one like I went on my first archery elk hunt two two Septembers ago and you're only yeah my only archery elk hunt so I'm still new to it I'm still learning all the time very much very much so and then you are going on your first archery elk hunt ever in next month yeah we're it's, talking about actually toting a bow yeah <laughs> we've been on a lot as far as filming but. right yeah that that is one thing i will say as a disclaimer uh when you know a lot of folks and stuff were asking me about you know like when i got to kill that one with my bow which i was i'm still very thankful for still not really it's still kind of surreal to me that yeah. it happened but i was like my one huge advantage that i did have is just through filming i've been able to watch it happen so many times so i kind of knew the process i mean you're sitting there with a camera especially on the kill cam i mean you're in the same position the hunter is right so you're you're seeing it unfold same everything except for you're not actually shooting the animal so on this episode i wanted to get just kind of a perspective of what goes through your head when you're getting ready for that hunt and also just kind of breaking down what you need you know what like what do you need to go out there and be successful and there's a lot of things that add into that that aren't always thought about i mean there's your obvious things like your bow your arrows and your release and your broadheads you know yeah stuff like that but there's stuff that you forget about you know um or you don't put as much emphasis on Mm -hmm. so let's just go go at it from from the top but for all that let's talk about let's talk about this like you you're getting ready like I said, it's, it's less than a month away now. How are you feeling? Yeah, we're leaving in three weeks, four weeks. So yeah. Most of the day, like the 15th, 16th. Today is August the 16th. Yeah, so we're leaving a month from two days ago. Yeah. Leaving like the 12th, 13th, something right. like that, 14th. How are you feeling? Uh, It's kind of starting to kick in, you know. Kinda, yeah. I'm starting to, like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. 
you know. It's a lot. I mean, it really is. If or it was to me. Mm-hmm. I can remember, like I started thinking about it. I started thinking about it as soon as they told me I was going to have a tag that year. Yeah, but well, I, I have too. But in the last couple of days, especially you started watching on Instagram and stuff. People are posting all these elk pictures and they're scouting and yeah, I mean, it just it starts to, to get a lot more real. Yeah, yeah. And we got you know dove season coming up in a couple of weeks and that's kind of the kickoff. You're like, okay, yeah. it's hunting season yeah. now. For those that that don't know, I think it's a pretty pretty easily a blanket statement for the southeast duff hunting is very much it's it's, a, it's huge down here yeah more, there's, there's more people that dove hunt on opening day than it is deer hunters yeah it's it's and it's more like i love this is a rabbit hole but i'm gonna go ahead and run down it i love dove season in the south yeah because it's so much more than the hunt man it's people it's 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 a it's a so much as a social gathering it is a hunt you mm-hmm. it's the startup college football yeah you know there's always a mississippi state football game on that day yeah um, it's it's a good day it's a good day but this, this year's gonna be a little odd because we're starting on sunday yeah sunday afternoon because the way the days fell or however that works yeah. but um but yeah anyhow so i, I won't chase that too far because i could talk about dove hunting for a while because i do love it but uh yeah that's usually when when the dove hunt happens you know all right here comes fall yeah and it's it's here and so um yeah let's get into like starting from the bare basics like with your gear and i want to get to what we do with like bows and arrows and our setups and all that but just as far as like stuff that you take like let's start with uh clothing Mm -hmm. you know how how important are the boots you wear that's what i was just fixing to say this is i've been on elk hunt every year now for the last six years yeah and I had some crappy boots the first couple of times. Yeah. And then when I came to work at Primo's, I got some Kenetrex. Right. Or either some good Danners, whatever. Yeah. The good boots. And it makes so much of a difference. It does. For, because, like, I know, like, the mindset. Because, again, some of those boots, if you look at them, some of them can get pricey. Yeah. But I can tell you from personal experience, taking care of your feet when you're elk hunting right there. Because elk hunting is so physical. Yeah. And... You know, it even starts if, at your tires. Even if, yeah, <laughs> even if you're sitting in a water hole, more often than not, you're having to walk to get there. Yeah. And and the terrain is that's what that's part of the allure that makes elk what they are is how they live in the rugged terrain that they live in. And so boots and socks are not something you want to fudge on. No. And gold bond foot powder. Oh yeah, <laughs> you introduced me to that. It's cooling sensation and makes you feel like you just got out of the spa. It's not. He's not lying. Like we laugh at it, but it's for real. The first time that that jordan's first year at primo's when he came and was was filming elk hunts with us i see him dumping this stuff into his socks like what are you doing he's like it's gold bond foot powder but that stuff even if you don't have a blister yeah it your your feet get hot and wore down and you you put just pour that powder in your socks and it refreshes them yeah i'm telling you i can't put and it may sound goofy i really i don't care if it does because it's 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 pretty it's legit like you need to take care of your feet yep, it's in a blue canister because yeah i mean it's yes yeah, gold bond looks like a regular thing of gold bond but it's blue and it says foot powder on it warning it gets cold so don't use it anywhere but your feet <laughs> it's a good point <laughs> it's a good point yeah. um but yeah because i would like a, a vast majority of the people that are thinking about going on first elk hunts and venturing out probably hitting public land and places like that and you're gonna be walking Mm -hmm. no ifs ands or buts about it you are going to be walking yeah but that's definitely that's where right where my mind was going when you were talking about what do you start with boots boots and socks yeah good boots something with great ankle support you can lace up tight you know i've got problems with ingrown toenails like crazy yeah and if my boots don't fit right like it takes a couple days and my freaking toes are bleeding yeah and that after that happens you're out you yeah, can't hardly I, yeah go. I, I can't emphasize it enough if you don't get the right boots you're going to be walking more than you're used to you're going to be walking in terrain that you're not used yeah. to like most likely at elevation you're not used to and so your feet are going to get taxed at a level they're not used to so you have to take care of your feet because and you think about it it's there's no indirect about it it will directly affect your hunt if you can't move around and walk around like you need to it's going to affect you think about this you can go out and buy eighty thousand dollar pickup and if it don't have any tires on it 
are if they're flat right it's doing you no good yeah you get you get you a nice pickup and put the tires for a honda accord it's not going to do you any yeah. good yeah first rock you hit you got a blowout right yeah good point that's a good way to think about it yeah um as far as like shirts and and pants and stuff um a lot of that i would probably say like man just hop on the weather app on your phone of where you're going to and yeah. kind of get an idea what the weather's going to look like well yeah i mean like say colorado for for instance where that high high altitude is mm -hmm. it may get below freezing at night and then during the middle of the day it gets up to 70 80 degrees right. it's so much of a, a difference in the temperature change yeah. in those high altitudes i i always find myself it looks it looks goofy or feels kind of goofy but i, I carry a little bit of everything yeah you know, because the 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 weather out there can change pretty a pretty good bit. You know. But one thing I've learned too about clothes, you can put on way too much if you're elk hunting. Yeah. Like you don't wear the if it's gonna be 30 degrees, you don't wear the same 30 degree outfit you would for deer hunting because yeah. of all the walking you're doing. Yeah. I mean, I'll just like if it's gonna be 40 in the morning, I'm wearing the same stuff I do here in early season whitetail. Yeah. Correct. Because you're walking and you don't get cold. Yeah. I would uh, I would probably suggest, like I said, just if you can bring a little bit of everything, but but make it to where you have the ability to layer up or layer down if you need to. Those those Drake Tech pants, the turkey pants yeah. we got this year, old yeah. time. The the uh, yeah, those are gonna be the ticket for sure. They're stretchy and they're tough, and I yeah. mean that's what I'm gonna be wearing this year when we're out there in them rocks. Yeah, that is a good point too because like. I can remember the first years I would wake up and it'd be really cold and I would put like some um some insulated underwear on, like yeah. bottoms. An hour into and it. And then you're you miserable. start walking and you're like, Oh my gosh, I gotta come out of these, you know. Yeah. So a lot of times like it's you're walking so much it equalizes. You don't need all that heavy stuff. Make sure they're not, you know, tied in the inseam and stuff because you're going to be changing in elevation, lifting, you know, lifting your knees up and that kind of stuff and you'll blow the inseam out of them in a heartbeat. Right, right. Um, that's very important shirt the shirts and the same thing apply pants and shirts like uh just something that is bring enough stuff where you can adapt to the weather yeah and comfortable is key yeah very yeah. very much so and there's so many options now for you know real like tech style hunting yeah. apparel you right. know the, this polyester stretchy stuff yeah. I and mean, it's awesome hunting and like you said that stuff that that old time stuff like i'm probably going to be using that a bunch oh no doubt yeah those tech shirts are they're pretty nifty yeah yeah no doubt about it another thing is a good pack yeah like a good pack one that's got pockets yeah uh, it's nothing more aggravating to me than getting a nice pack and it has nowhere to store anything it's got one big pack right you know, one big one big storage in it yeah everything's I, just jumbled up in there i've been using that um it's a camelback i've got the same one camelback it? tree stand tr trophy i can't remember what it's called whitetail or something yeah i think it's a tr tree stand i could look it up but um that one's been nice because it, it's uh it's like you you don't want just a big pack with one big pocket yeah your stuff rattles around you can't find anything and a lot of times you know when you're elk hunting you're packing snacks and food and water you know your food will get smashed and then you know like maybe if you have a backup release your release ends up down at the bottom mm -hmm. of the entire bag rattling you want something that has multiple pockets so you can kind of have everything compartmentalized where you know where it is and the coolest thing about that pack it comes with this little wallet yep and you can put your tags a couple knives your extra blades if you're using the you know have like a have on or something like that yep and you can keep it all in one little compartment yep. and it I, folds out i use that thing exclusively so i know where my hunting license a pen so i can write everything down mm -hmm. and some electrical tape yeah i have or i have my electrical tape right next to it so yep. i can you know and you, you can put a hydration bladder in it and yeah i mean all that makes a big difference hydration bladders are the ticket yeah hydration is the ticket out yeah. there take it from first-hand experience you do not want to get dehydrated <laughs> out there <laughs> i got i got how elevation sickness and when i went on turkey hunting colorado one time it's not fun no that that is one thing to definitely think about especially if you're like us you know a couple flatlanders living at sea level yeah we're at 300 feet here yeah you want to take drink your water like don't get it, it's different you know, it feels a lot different when you're when you're up there. Like down here, it's so humid. You got to make yourself drink right. up there. Right, because up there, the it's so much drier. You don't sweat near as much, mm -hmm. so you don't think about. Or I, you know, I didn't get near as thirsty as I usually do. 
Yeah. So I didn't drink my water. I got the first year I went out there, I got dehydrated towards the end of the month. Like we were on our like last leg of the of the trip that year in Colorado. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. You, I mean, you're going you want to be peeing every 45 minutes mm-hmm. at least because you want to drink that much water. I can remember we went to um, the basin, slated, killed an elk the day before. No, I'm sorry. Um, I can't remember how it went down, but I, we spent an entire day up at the basin, which is which fluctuates anywhere from 11,000 to 12,000 feet if you get up on the sides. And uh, that whole day, I mean, like we stayed in elk that whole day, was trying to just, you know, at the end of the day, I remember thinking we were driving down the mountain. I was like, I drank two bottles of water that whole day. Yeah, that and, ain't good. And then the next day I got sick mm-hmm. just because I was not drinking enough. So if you take if one of the big takeaways if you're going elk hunting drink your water yeah stay I mean, hydrated I strongly suggest getting a hydration pack camelback yeah. makes great ones yeah camelback makes the that's, hydration that's bladders their bread and butter. Yeah, yeah that's what they do and yeah. that, that makes it easier to do and then they also um you know have like the 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 big what do they call them the water bottle things like tree stand pack you're talking about comes with that exactly it comes with a big old water bottle yeah um, holds like a half gallon and those are also I li- the reason i like using that one is because it's better than taking like a plastic water bottle because when it gets low it'll start crunching you're making well, you, noise yeah and it's so it's so large it holds like three bottles of water right so you take that big one that camelback makes and you get plenty of water plus your hydration bladder but you, then you get that and you're not making any noise whatsoever because no there's nothing worse than a crunchy water bottle Especially yeah. if you're hunting with Brad Ferris. <laughs> He's picky about that he noise. He will give you the evil eye so fast you start crunching <laughs> the bottle of water. Um, I'm trying to think of other things that I keep in my pack. Um, knives. You want to have good knives. Yep. I've got, what, what's that brand? Oh, I don't remember. But there's one that's folding. It's got a gut knife and a. Outdoor and, edge. Yes, yeah, outdoor edge, flipping zip or whatever it's called. Mm-hmm. One of them orange ones. Mm-hmm. It's, it's awesome and I got a couple smaller knives too yeah knives are i know i'm gonna probably say something along the lines a lot i've said it already is you don't you can't put enough emphasis on whatever well knives are another one of those things yeah elk got some thick skin Mm -hmm. and if you're gonna kill an elk i'm assuming you should be wanting to take care of that meat it's a lot of meat so you're gonna need some good skin in that yeah and some type of sharpening Mm-hmm. sharpening the vice that's yep. the key because as soon as you get that elk peeled back just down his back you're gonna need to sharpen exactly yeah i so, don't care what kind of knife you got yeah. Just look dull. yeah they have thick thick hides you know like they're large animals and they live in some crazy stuff yep. and they're, they're tough man they're tough so yeah knives um folding saw folding saw for working on the elk and trimming limbs yeah everything you would be surprised how much you use a saw if you take one yeah it's it's like a folding saw and electrical tape. Both of them have like a bazillion uses yeah. that you don't realize until you get out there and don't have it and you go, crap. And zip ties. Zip ties. I don't know what you use them for on Elk Hunt, but they come in handy. I always have them. <laughs> Just, I always have them. Um, obviously, if you're planning to be successful, yeah. you probably want to have some, some game bags. Yeah. Speaking on knives and that kind of stuff, a multi-tool. Yeah. Multi-tools are worth their weight in gold. Mm-hmm. And Gerber makes a great one. Or Leatherman makes a great one. Mm-hmm. They're not that expensive, like thirty bucks. And you, as you, you would be so surprised on the stuff you can use that multi tool for. Yeah, I always have. Uh, there's one in my pack right now. I was actually going through my pack last night. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I always have one of those as well. Uh, Jimmy gave us those, didn't he? He did. Yeah, he did. Uh, clippers, yeah. Lim- limb clippers. Yep. That seem a lot of this stuff seems minuscule, but this like again. I'll say anything, any good knowledge I have, I have because I've either screwed up enough where I finally figured out the right way to do it or someone taught me. Mm -hmm. And I'm learning all this just from this will be my sixth season we're going into with Primos, and I'm just learning from all those guys. And so, like, trimming limbs, like if you're setting up real quick, you know, if something's happening, an elk's bugling coming, you don't want to be trying to break them with your hands. You want to just be able to go snip, snip, snip and have yourself – Sometimes, sometimes you do want to break them with your hands. Yeah, yeah, but you, <laughs> just you depends know. on the scenario. Yeah, but if if you need to be quiet, you want to be able to just clip real quick. Yep. So those are those are very very valuable to in have. In the too. situation you're trying to sneak in on elk inside a water hole or something like that, but if I mean if you're calling a one breaking limbs is not a big deal. Correct. Yeah. Because he thinks there's another bull over there. Correct. I've seen Wilbur do that. That first time, everybody. I, the first time I saw him do it, I didn't know what was happening. I was like, shouldn't he be quiet? But then I realized he was trying to sound like. You know, just another bull. Yeah, breaking a tree. Mm-hmm. So you got game bags. Mm-hmm. 
I'll have some too. I usually been uh waiting I'm just letting you carry those. <laughs> <laughs> I um, carry the food like carries the essentials to actual hunt with. <laughs> but if you're yeah, I mean like you definitely want to have some some snacks with you too. Um and it sounds like I like I told uh, I was talking to somebody about going on the first elk hunt. Like I know it's like a big thing floating around the hunting industry these days. Some people do the like the I don't know the whole mountain ops things that our boy Levi gets into. <laughs> And you want to make light of it, but you need to have something with some good nutritional value out there because you lose, a, you burn through a lot of energy and calories yeah. walking around. Protein bars. I forget what them ones we chewed on last year were. Them um, ones with an egg and peanuts. Yeah, and RX bars. Is what those called. things are awesome. We use. I've done those. I've done um, Quest bars. I've done um, Cliff bars. Yeah. Just something. And those are small. You can put a lot of them in there. Uh, there's a lot of companies that make them. Yeah. Um, those RX uh, bars last year are my favorite. They don't taste like cardboard. No, they don't. And they're, they're like I said, they don't. They keep for a long time. You don't really have to worry about smashing them. Uh, Wilbur likes those, um, what are they called? Kind bars. Yeah. I, I don't like those as much, but he does. And you get kind of the same kind of mm-hmm. stuff out of them. Because you really, when you're hiking that much, you need it. Some you know. chocolate. Chocolate, yeah. Dark chocolate. We carry a bunch of it with us just because it's the energy boost in a hurry. Yeah. Um, it's not bad for you. Yeah. Not uh, that I'm worried about that. <laughs> no, man, this ain't a dietary episode. I just know what, what it feels like to be out there, Yeah. you know. And you don't want to carry a bunch of bulky stuff just because of space. Mm-mm. That's why, that's why we carry those bars, exactly for that reason. Yeah. And we'll make a sandwich and that kind of stuff, and everybody have a sandwich in their bag, and we'll sit down for an hour or two and eat lunch. And yeah. Eat on peanuts and yeah. that kind of stuff. I know some guys they'll even take like a they'll take like a flour tortilla and just put peanut butter in it, and maybe some someone put honey in it, roll it up, stick because that's another one of those things you can put in a bag. If if it gets smashed, what does it matter? It's yeah. a tortilla, you know. Yep. But it's the same kind of a deal. It's just that's kind of a user preference but you want to have something Mm -hmm. you want to have some kind of substance while you're out there your your body will get wore down really really quick yeah no doubt Uh, what else i tote in the pack since we're on packs we might as well just go down through it finish that one Mm -hmm. out for sure oh i got flagging tape in there flagging tape that's a good that's a good call now this is just what's in my pack not in my bow vest too yeah we'll get to that whole different ball game too um uh, i usually have flashlights or a headlamp I got two or three flashlights because yeah. you don't know something could go wrong when you're out there in the dark and right you want more than one yeah they don't have to be a big one i know? have a, a handheld i have one of our blood hunter hds and i have a headlamp yeah and like you said i have multiple and then i usually have um at least two of those small packs of double a batteries mm-hmm. or triple a whatever your you know whatever your uh flashlight holds yeah something something to that effect uh flashlights are important flag and tape is important for the sake of whether you're marking a blood trail um whether you're i mean some of these places you're going in you don't know where you go exactly you're trying to mark a way out there's yeah. there's a, a billion different uses for those if you use on x you have the ability you can download an area mm-hmm. so that helps but i always like i said flag and tape's a good a good thing especially if you're hunting like public land or something yeah you want to be able to find your way out uh, I've got a phone charger in my backpack. Hard, yeah. Hardly ever break it out, but it's there if I need it, you know. Yeah. I kind I wonder if they're... A lot of these places, you don't have service, so your phone's on airplane yeah. mode all day. It really doesn't die that fast. No. I, I was thinking, though, like, I wonder if there's any, like, legal issues with leaving in certain... Not in any of the places we've been to, but, like, I wonder if, like, some of those places, there's issues with, like, leaving flag and tape up. Oh, I'm sure you need to pick it up as you Pull it up out. as you go down. Yeah, just wanted to just a put, that at, put that out there. Good gesture to do anyway. Yeah. So, yeah, don't just leave it. Yeah. You find your marker, pull it back down. Um, assuming most of y'all do that anyway, but you should. Mm-hmm. Um, what else we got in our packs? Toilet paper. Toilet paper. Speaks, for, speaks for itself. Wet wipes, you know, dude wipes, whatever, all that. I mean, keep it in one ziplock bag together. Yeah. Dude wipes or baby wipes. Um, Not just for going to the bathroom, but cleaning up yourself it, after it, you go to elk or exactly. whatever. Exactly. Also... Gutting gloves, if you can get them. Absolutely. A yeah. uh, pair of gutting gloves and latex gloves. Mm-hmm. Put the gutting gloves on, then put the latex gloves on top of that. That way your hands are tight. And a lot of those gutting gloves kind of baggy on your fingers yeah. and whatnot. They'll tear up fast. Yeah. And honestly, you know, I know some guys, it's like a thing that they'll do. They're like, I don't need no gutting gloves. And, you know, if you don't you want do. to use them, whatever. But honestly, you know, after 
a while if you do it barehanded, which I've done that before too. Your hands get so much stuff on them, you can't work as well. Yeah. You know, I, I honestly can. I just do better when I got the gloves on. I can yeah, work faster. You're working on an animal, and you get done, and want to sit down, and drink water for a minute, take the gloves off, and your hands are clean. Exactly. Yeah, good and gloves always. Um, are we leaving anything out? I feel like we've covered most of it as far as packs. I've got a little pullover in there. Like a little, a little fleece pullover. Like a pullover jacket. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just a little one. Just something that that's going to keep you a little bit warmer if you need to. Yeah. Rain jacket. Yeah, well, that's what mine is. Yeah. It's a rain jacket slash little right. pullover deal. Right, yeah. Which we always have trash bags too, but that's probably specific to us because that's for like a camera cover if it yeah. starts raining. Yeah. Which a lot of people carry GoPros and stuff these days, which those are waterproof. But if you're carrying a handy cam or something, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of people trying to film their hunts might want to carry something you can cover it up with real quick if it starts to rain. Yeah, and those backpacks come with a rain cover too. Yeah, the camelbacks is... too, which are great. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those those things have like a hundred different cool features. Um might be about covered it for packs if i can think of anything i'm else. sure we're forgetting something i mean i keep my bugle in mind too there is while we're sitting there rattling off through this on the primo's website right now there's the um ultimate hunt checklist ultimate for elk. ultimate elk hunt checklist for gun and bow and we all went through that list and fine tooth combed it and put on there exactly what we thought you should need to go elk yeah. hunting. so if you're listening to this which obviously if you just heard me say that you are listening to this so <laughs> it's a little redundant but um so yeah uh, hopefully you'll get some out of this conversation but it would also be a good idea for you it's, not, it's easy to get to primos.com and uh go over the the ultimate elk hunt checklist like i said it's a guide for bow hunting and gun hunting yeah both we shot two different videos for it that's a pretty cool deal you know yeah. I just didn't throw it together. We yeah. went through it good. Wilbur talking about what he takes bow hunting, and then Jimmy talking about what he takes gun hunting. And mm -hmm. it, like I said, it is it's very in depth. It's not generalized at all. Mm -hmm. Like it's specific what we take and why we take it. And the bow vest. Yeah, bow vest. Let's go to that. It makes yeah. it makes this the it's the obvious progression. Move from the pack to the bow vest. Yeah. For one, like some people don't wear a vest. It, again, I couldn't go without it. No, not after you. If once you get used to wearing one, it's yes, it's a little bit hotter. But I mean, once you get used to wearing one, yeah, I mean, you can't go without it. It's it's not hot enough to ever make me consider not using it. No, absolutely. But I'm just throwing yeah. it out there. Yeah. You know? Um, just cause like, what I carry in my bow vest is what like the essentials I need for the hunt. Yeah close to me where i can get to it really quick mm -hmm. like it, it, it's 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 it, your go stuff it's this is what i need it right it takes now. time to get stuff out of your backpack and that else coming you don't need to be fumbling around getting stuff out of your backpack yeah. when he starts his move you want to be able to throw it backpack on the ground yeah. and get ready there's so much elk hunting that's just it's like stage and stage and staging and then when it starts happening you need to be able to go yeah so when that moment starts happening you don't need to be fumbling through your pack that's why you put your your essentials for that in your bow vest mm -hmm. um obviously a rangefinder is is huge yeah um i keep one of those i think it's in my it's in my top right pocket and say i'm different it's in my middle pocket that's where i can get to it the fastest top, which one's this one right here top that's, middle pocket yeah top right that's where i keep my wind checkers right here in the very mm -hmm. top one mm -hmm. yeah and i have it strung up with that little d loop so it's impossible for me to drop it and lose it yeah and also, I can, like, kind of leave it there hanging if I need to pick it back up real quick, you know? Yeah, I mean, an elk gets there at 60, 70 yards, and you can range a spot. You can just drop it and leave it hanging. Yeah. And shoot, you know? Yeah. You ain't got to worry about sticking it back in a pocket. Yeah. Range finder is a huge one in there. Um, your, I, I keep a release in there. Um, if you don't have a wrist strap one, if you have, like, a thumb release or something, you can keep your release uh, release in there and zip it up so it's not going to fall out. Yeah, I've got one in my bow vest and one in my pack. Mm -hmm. It's one thing we forgot to say. It was mm -hmm. in our pack. I can always carry two. Yeah. It, this is my first elk hunt, but I've always even carried a release with me when I'm filming. In case somebody lost theirs. You never know. Yeah, you it's never know. Always a good idea. Even if you're not planning on shooting elk, carry one with you if you're with somebody that is. Yeah, very good point. Um, let me think. I, I know we said limb clippers in your pack, and I do, but I also have limb clippers in my bow vest. Mm -hmm. Like I said, they're back small, up here. Small ones. Yeah, small ones. Um, I keep a, a lens cloth for my binos yep. um, and for my rangefinder. Uh, what else do I got in there? 
I usually keep peppermints or something like that in one of the pockets because, believe it or not, when you're walking and you got a peppermint in your mouth, you don't get so cotton. dry mouth. Yeah, it yeah. helps so much. Yeah. And uh, let's see what else I got in there. I always have like batteries and stuff. But that's for camera. Running. Yeah, well, I'm trying to think of it like hunt, <laughs> yeah. hunt the stuff I use yeah, to hunt. Yeah, you're not carrying cameras. We usually got camera batteries and all kinds of stuff everywhere else, and then plus our hunting stuff. But. Yeah, um, I always have like again, I always have in that like side pocket right there. I always have my hoochie mama stuck down in there. Yeah, we got them both tied on the loops on both sides. Yeah, um, I have. Uh, some mouth calls in there that i can access really quickly yep. and then like my like i have a i guess it's technically a lanyard but it's not like a big old duck lanyard i have like a small lanyard that has a hyperlip single on it and uh i make it a bull crazy close range mm -hmm. and it's small enough i can just shove it in one of those pockets because i don't want to be walking around with it hanging around my neck but when you know time to start calling or whatever you can just pull it out real quick it's like the first time we went hunting with ben i didn't know you were going to talk about that <laughs> but we can <laughs> we can i'm not against it <laughs> oh gosh we were in uh new mexico fence lake new mexico yeah first time i ever met ben really hey, man i just started first time i've been around him at any time and granted ben was very new to the elk hunting game too yeah and uh first afternoon he pulls out this lanyard he's got like 10 elk calls jingling and on i'm it. talking a lanyard a duck, duck you know, lanyard. braided paracord <laughs> lanyard with rings on it and clinkers and it seriously had like a dozen elk calls hanging from it sounded like one of santa claus's reindeer when he walked. Cha -ching, cha -ching, cha -ching, cha -ching. <laughs> i remember because i saw that and i was like what is he doing with that so i mean if you're good with it do it but whatever <laughs> we didn't give him any heck about it did None, we? not at all not at all we still don't bring it up four years later <laughs> <laughs> but, hey ben you got your duck lanyard elk lanyard i'm sorry yeah, but well, I'm right there with you. Uh, I carry a hyperlip single. I th that's the only really read call. I use a hyperlip single. I just love it. It's so mm -hmm. easy to blow. I use the primary the hyperlip single. Um, I like it a lot because it has that converter on there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I like the Make It a Bull Crazy, the close range one. I have a long range one, but I don't keep that in my vest. Yeah, I keep that where I on a on an outer pocket of my pack because usually when I'm I'm calling. I can either get loud if I want to with the hyperlip, mm -hmm. but that the I make it a bull crazy. It has that that flexible uh, material on the barrel. You can just like kinda, old rubber neck right. Drunk call. Mm -hmm. You can just I don't know. It has so much play in it. I can make all the different sounds I want to. Um, so I carry a screw in hook with me. Yep. Yeah. Uh, whether just to hang my backpack up when we're sitting down eating lunch or hang my bow up i guess if i mm -hmm. this first time toting a bow but i'm a, i always carry a screw in t-hook with me mm -hmm. you know they use you can use them for a lot of different things even hanging meat bags up you know they're not a bad a not a bad idea that's, a, that's one of those things that you don't think about but when you have it you're like man it sure is nice that we have this thing yeah once you get your quarters in a meat bag or whatever we always hang them up just so it don't have to risk getting dirt or whatever on them just thought of something too paracord yeah paracord we use paracord for a ton of different things. One of those things being, uh, for when we get them in meat bags, a lot of times we we'll use that to hang them from a tree. Because mm -hmm. you want to get it off the ground if you can. It helps it cool air, it and keep it not out. as dirty, air out, all that good stuff. Yep. Um, and a lot of, like if you're hunting public land, you have a pretty good chance that you'll have to leave some hanging in a tree for a while. Yep. You know, So paracord is, is really nice for that. So I've always got a lighter in my bow vest too, mm -hmm. just for whatever reason, burning paracord. <laughs> If mm -hmm. you get cold, start a fire. I guess you make. I mean, like, there's stuff that can happen out but, there. I mean, we use, we've used a lighter before. Yeah, we yeah. have. Yeah, uh -huh. I do. Uh, man, I keep forgetting stuff in my backpack, but I have got an emergency bow to like setting up. You kit. do. You've you've had to use it. Yeah, I'm glad. That's a very good point. Um, I've got five or six different uh, broadheads in there. Not different ones, but five or six broadheads in there. Uh, enough strength uh, D-loop material to put four or five D-loops on if we need to, a pair of tweezers, uh, some serving, an extra peep sight. Mm -hmm. What else I got in there? I got some knocks, you know, just regular knocks, some practice heads. Yeah, I was about you got field tips in there too because if, like, say, instance, your D-loop messes up, you got to retie D-loop. Well, then you can put a field tip on your arrow and in. you can find something to shoot. I got you know. a pair of Allen wrenches in it. This is a little bitty box, but I've got everything in there you need to 
emergency set up a bow. It's just like a little bit of tackle box, isn't it? Yeah, small. It's like two inches by three inches but and about it, an inch deep. Yeah. That thing can save you mm-hmm. if you're, you know, deep in the woods and you, you know, or your something goes wrong with your bow. Yeah. Well, what do you do? You know, that thing is 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 very valuable to have. And mm-hmm. like another thing, y'all bear with us because, like I said, I'm trying very hard to stay on point. But like I just remember, it, like in my pack, I keep a little first aid kit. Yeah. In there. In case you get a, a blister or a cut on your hand or, or something. It's a lot of stuff to take. It is, but like I said, elk hunting is it it's it's on up there. Like it I mean, I'm not gonna say it's I mean it's an extreme hunt, it is. Call I mean call yeah. it what it is. It's uh so I mean yeah, the, the first aid kit for you know, in case you get a cut, I mean like there's some neosporin in there, some gauze pads, stuff can happen out there. Once again, just revert back to the list we made. Yeah, on the uh, website. yeah, yeah. Because there's, I mean, we'll probably get to the end of the episode and still have forgotten something. Oh yeah. But go to that checklist because we all, all six of us looked over that thing, mm-hmm. for sure. Hmm. Okay. So bow vest, release, rangefinder. I've got gloves in it. Gloves. Yeah. Little thicker pair, little cotton pair, and a thin pair. Right. I don't um, have any real thick stuff because I had never needed it. Right. Yeah. Me either. Um, um little beanie in there too we got inside pockets on the bow vest that's mm-hmm. where we're at right now you mm-hmm. unzip it and they're on the inside next to your torso mm-hmm. um yeah i think that about covers what i got in my bow vest i believe and wind checkers wind checker yes i keep that you right there mentioned up top. That, but yeah. that's there's uh i would carry one in my bow vest and one in my backpack i would ca- use them very often i would carry them enough where you're not going to run out yeah because mm-hmm. wind Wind is as important for elk hunting as it is in whitetail hunting, if not more. Yeah. It's, it's right up there. Yeah, no doubt. So, so wind checker. You, uh, you, uh, an elk winds you, they're running for miles. Yeah, you ain't, probably ain't getting him back. <laughs> um, let's, go, let's go into calls. I, said, I know we kind of touched on that already. Um, but uh, like I said, obviously, you're going to be wanting to make some cow sounds and some bull sounds. Yeah. Um, like and you, you kind of went over the ones you carry. I kind of went over the ones that I carry as far as reed call goes. Um, as far as mouth calls, uh, top pin. Top pin's my favorite. Yep. Um, but again, yes. mouth mouth calls to elk are about the same as mouth calls for turkey. Everyone blows one a little bit different. Mm-hmm. So that's just what works best for me. Yeah, that's that's I'm the same way. I've tried every one of them, and I can make elk noises on all of them. But that's the one that comes out the easiest and the clearest for me. Yeah. And, and, well, that's for, for cow noises. I, if I want to bugle on a mouth call instead of, uh, which I usually, like 95% of the time, I'm just using the blue reed yeah, that we have I, in our bugles. I suck trying to bugle. <laughs> I have not fa- mastered that one yet. Well, that's what the blue reeds are for. Yeah. Um, which, if y'all don't know, every Primo's bugle that is made right now mm-hmm. has uh, the blue reed system. Yeah. So um, It's a very, molded you know it's a molded top to our bugle right that's got a blue reed on it that's why it's called the blue reed system but it's uh molded where you just throw your lips on it and push air through it and it makes a noise it's it's very easy to to figure out and uh every one of those when you get one inside the cap when you pop the cap open inside there you have some extra reeds yeah and if you're curious about it we've got so many youtube videos on. yeah it. seriously go to the primo's youtube channel uh in playlist there's one called how to elk hunt that's where where all that stuff mm-hmm. is um and in the the product videos when he when wilbur's going over the different elk bugles um but they're also made like where you can pop that blue reed off and bugle with a mouth yeah. call if you want to like i i cow call best on the top pin but the the money maker is what i bugle best on and you can pop that blue reed off too and make cow muse through the bugle to get that extra distance for sure for sure yeah like I said, it's uh elk calling is is obviously it's a big part of of the whole thing um and so you want to make sure you got something that you're confident in like i said everyone's going to have something that works best for them like miss mary primos i don't know how many bull elk she's called in for wilbur over the years but like that cowgirl call yeah she loves it see wilbur still i remember when we shot the video where he was talking about that call he went inside the house and got hers her cowgirl call that she uses and it had it had lipstick stains on on Mm -hmm. it where she could from her using it so many times over the years what she always say she knows how the women talk she she, she goes i know how they think (laughs) i ain't arguing with her she's caught in a pile of them Mm -hmm. i've seen her do it (laughs) yeah she knows the game um so yeah, elk calling is is calls that you're just comfortable with. You want to take time to figure that out. Uh, bugles, 
I personally, I use the bullet bugle more than any of them. Yeah, it's so compact. You throw it in your pack or just throw it on that lanyard around your neck, and it's, it doesn't get in the way. Mm -hmm. Terminator is awesome, too, because it folds up. It know? is. That's why I like the bullet bugle so much, just for what you just said. I can get all the sounds I want out of it, mm -hmm. uh, and it's not huge. Yeah. I don't, I, I get, that's a preference thing. Some people like those huge barrel bugle tubes. If that's what you like we have those too mm -hmm. I, I just like the bugle too because it's so small i'm a i'm a minimalist i it's, guess it's worked a lot of times too buddy. yes it has golly very much so i wish i had a number on how many elk we've called up with that little bullet bugle ain't no telling i mean it's 40 50 60 since i've been here probably a lot <laughs> a lot it works Hey guys, while we're talking about elk calls, I gotta take a second to tell y'all about the sale going on at Primos.com. Right now, through Wednesday, August 21st, you can get 15% off all elk calls. So head to Primos.com and check that out. So that's that's calls. Um, let's go into this is let's go into bow setups mm -hmm. specifically because that's a big part of it. And I've changed mine up a little bit this year just for this reason. Yep, yep. Um, so bow setups both me and you are shooting uh matthew's verdicts mm -hmm. uh, i got 29 and a half inch draw 70 pound bow is that right? set 70 pounds i'm shooting um gold chip kinetic pierce platinums mm -hmm. 300 spine um i could shoot that, that that's another thing that we can get on like you you shoot uh 250 spines yeah they're a little bit stiffer <laughs> mm -hmm. just for the reason that i want as much kinetic I don't guess it's actually kinetic energy hitting them, but I want the most force. Yeah, I want. I, I'm I'm a big believer. I mean, obviously, I I mean I like speed, but I will never put speed over. No, I, I, I want a big heavy air. I want to blow through that elk. I've never ever been worried about trying to hit 330 feet a second. Yeah, because it really doesn't make that much difference. No, I was. T it's when I had like I had T Bone on here. I can't remember the exact speed, but he was talking. You know, like because I've dude, heard that dude's got it figured out. He knows. <laughs> like he's he's fooled with bows for a long time, and he was telling me, you know, because I've heard some people, you know, like they'll shoot their bow through a, a chronograph, and it'll be like three o two, you know, and they're mm -hmm. like, man, I want to get it up to three twenty. I'm like, you're not even going to see any distance, any change in your pins until like i think it's like past 60 yards or something like that yeah. so I, I don't put as much emphasis on that i want i want a big heavy arrow that i can get i don't want a big yeah i want a little heavy arrow. yeah oh, yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that's why i shoot to get good point big's probably a miss a misstatement but that's why i like those pierces and like it's 300 spine my arrows are not quite as heavy as yours but they're like i could shoot a 340 spine i could shoot a 400 spine yeah according but, to what you can shoot out of your bow with uh the draw length and weight you're pulling i think the recommended 340 right and, and i could shoot 340 and probably honestly because like with the 300 spines i'm shooting like i think like 306 or something like that and if people don't know what we're talking about the numbers on these spines the higher the number they go the more flex you have in the spine mm -hmm. it's not necessarily weight but it's the more flex in the spine. Right. Because our kinetic chaos is uh, 400 in those way more than my arrows. Correct. But they're a lot more flexible. Right. So I want a stiff, heavy arrow. Right. That's why I'm shooting a 250 spine. It's the stiffest spined arrow that we make in the pierce. Right. Um, but, yeah, I put, a, I put a lot of emphasis on that. Just because, I mean, think about it, man. It's the same Say, I guess, you know, like we were talking about boots, you don't want to fudge on that. You yeah. Know, you don't want to fudge on your bow setup because more than likely mm -hmm. you get one shot. Yeah. And it's, it's everybody's different setup, too. It, this may not work for a guy yeah, with a 27 inch that, draw. That's just what works for me. Yeah. Um, a, a thing that you can do, I, like, honestly, there's so many resources out there these days. If if you don't have, you know, a, a draw length and a you know a 70 pound but if you don't have the exact same setup that we're talking about you can probably go talk to a someone who's been before or someone at archery pro shop that knows what they're talking about and say hey i got this i'm going elk hunting what do i need to do and mm -hmm. they can probably steer you in the right direction and you go to gold tips web our youtube page tim gillingham yeah got so many and that dude he's above my head when he gets to talking but he's so like precise on what he's talking about you right. learn a lot from watching those videos correct correct for yeah. era setup a dude's he knows what he's doing mm -hmm. 
And I said, there's so many resources out there these days. But the main point is, like, get your bow to a setup that you're comfortable with. Yeah. And then, this seems like an obvious one, but practice. Yeah. I mean, going to my setup, like, we touched on speed and all that. To, to clear it up, I want the hardest hit and error I can get out mm-hmm. of my setup. Right. You're talking about shooting an 800-pound animal, seven, eight 800 pounds. Yep. 900 pounds sometimes. Big old animal. Yeah. And you bow hunt enough, you're going to mess up. Yeah. And I want to set up, if I do mess up and center a rib or do catch a side of that shoulder blade, that it's going to go through. I'm not going to go through the shoulder on the elk, even with my setup. No. It's, it's just, if you hit that shoulder, you're done. Yeah. Unless you just hit it just right. Yeah. But I want that setup where I know I'm going to get penetration. Yeah. It's the same setup I use for shooting deer, but I upped the poundage this year. I've yeah. been shooting like 65 pounds for deer just because I don't need to shoot 70. Yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. That that's a good point too. If if you yeah, just get get something you're comfortable with, that'll get the job done. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Pra- practice a lot, mm-hmm. you know. Because like I said, I, I remember um, there's some tips that I've gotten over the years as far as just practicing with your bow. Uh, for a while there, I was just I'd made a decision that I wasn't going to shoot past forty. You know, because I didn't know how I was going to react the first time an elk coming in. I didn't know if I was yeah. just going to lose all composure. A lot of times, man, out there out west, if you're in, like, somewhere open, you could have shots a lot past 40. Oh, yeah. So Very easy. But I just made a personal decision. I was like, you know what, being my first one, you know, I know my abilities. I just don't want to push past 40. So now, If you're hunting public land, you may only have one shot. Correct. So you need to practice, 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 and be comfortable comfortable you may not ever shoot one at 80 90 yards but be comfortable shooting that far yeah that was my that was my point levi's the one that told me that Mm -hmm. levi morgan he knows a little bit about bows not a whole lot but a little bit he's learning he's learning i've helped him out some over the years yeah he Uh, still asks me tips and stuff all the time i'm like man levi you gotta figure this out for yourself he was telling me he won something the other day i'd be something i'd never heard of it sounded like i was like oh cool i wonder if they gave him a little trophy (laughs) yeah (laughs) oh no but uh no levi seriously he's a wealth of information Mm -hmm. and he was like man even if you are going to shoot 40 and in which and honestly this year i probably put the same standard on myself just because you know like i I don't want to make i want to make the best shot i can make but again going levi said if you say even if you're not going to shoot past 30 yards practice at 60 50 60 70 80 just because if you can if you can get consistent and shoot good groups at 80 yards 70 yards 60 yards it gets so much easier when you come back to 40 30 20 you know no doubt it it makes you better. And another thing I've done in my setup this year is I've took a lot of weight off of it just for the purpose of toting it. As far as what? My stabilizer weight. Okay. Everything, pretty much. I've slimmed my setup down from what I'd had for whitetail hunting. Gotcha. I mean, I've took probably a pound and a half of weights off. Okay. And that's one thing I've done. I've changed stabilizers from going from an extreme hunter, you know, front bar and back bar. Right. I've got the, what's it called? The slide bar, counter slide. Counter slide. D stinger. Yep. And that thing's cool. Yeah. Because it's one stabilizer, it serves the purpose of two. Yep. And you can slide it front or back to get the balance you need, but you've still only got one stabilizer that weighs half of what I had. Right. So that's yeah. that's helping me so far. Yeah. I see your point on that. Yeah. Take, you know, because again, you're hiking a lot. Mm-hmm. And. I mean, this stuff adds up in weight. A pound and a half might not seem like much, but in elk hunting, when you're toting all that stuff, it those little pounds, they add up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, broadheads, that's a that's the million-dollar question. That's probably what you get more than anything. What broadhead do you shoot? Rage plus P. Rage hypodermic I've plus P. never shot elk with a bow, but I've seen a pile of them so far. Um, and every one I've seen shot in the right spot with a plus P has failed pretty dang quick within a hundred yeah I've, the only ones i've seen go past a hundred yards one we've found them unless unless they got shot in the shoulder you yeah know. i mean that happens that's bow hunting you, if you're not if you don't hit them in the right spot they're not going to die. right so but a, a a rage hypodermic plus p that's a inch and a half cut yeah it's small enough to st- the whole purpose of shooting a plus p is that it's an inch and a half diameter 
a lot of people think you got to have these big cut and broad heads which is they're great on deer mm -hmm. but you think about a rib on a on a elk as big as a deer's leg bone right i mean they're big and that plus p is small enough where it slides right in between them right so uh yeah i, I shoot those i have i mean I'm, there's a lot of good broadheads out there yeah i'm just speaking to what i know i have a hundred percent confidence in a rage hypodermic plus p no doubt and you, that's a lot of how you and that's not a sponsored plug no it's not it's a <laughs> We're not it's, sponsored by home. it's a uh a, a lot of how you perform for me at least is how much confidence you have in what you got yeah so i i, I want to be where i'm completely confident in my bow setup in the area i'm using i want to be completely confident in my broadhead and i want to have practiced enough that i'm completely confident in yeah. what i can do and a lot of people don't think with a that expandable slide broadhead slide opening broadhead whatever it's called i don't know all these scientific terms for them but a rage mm -hmm. a lot of people don't think you can get a pass through with them mm -mm. they think it's impossible it's not it's all about bow setup yeah I mean, if you're shooting a toothpick at them, you're not going to get a pass through. Yeah. This is, I mean, like, this is not me being braggadocious at all. This is just, I, I, I talked to eno enough people and learned the bow setup I needed. Yeah. Arrowed everything, everything. Mm -hmm. And when I shot that elk two years ago with, with my bow, blew through him and it was stuck in the ground halfway up the shaft on, on yeah. the, uh, you know, blew through him like hot butter. Mm -hmm. That's what you want. I mean, obviously, you can kill him without a pass through. Like if you shoot one quarter and away, and it buries in his offside shoulder, you've still done the thing. But I want as much penetration as I can get. Yeah, the thing I've learned deer hunting: if you got two holes, they leak out a lot faster than you get one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you can you can absolutely get a pass through with a rage. Yeah. That's I, I've seen it oh, firsthand. Yeah. A bunch of times. And I've seen it more with just mine. I've seen it done. Yeah. So. um but that's, and, that's what I'm shooting. You know, there's a lot of a lot of folks that are, you know, they don't believe in expandables. They want a fixed blade with an elk. You know, if if that's your thing, whatever. If, like you're, if you're confident in it, do it. Yeah. Like I said, I'm not – I'm just telling you what I'm confident in. Mm -hmm. Like I said, and I, I know what a rage can do. And I also know that thing shoots exactly like my field points. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. I have nothing to worry about. I don't have to practice all summer with my field points and go, okay, i got to readjust now because I'm shooting my broadheads. Nope. Yep. nothing changes everything's the same and that's invaluable no doubt um so let's go i think we've covered all the gear one i get one thing we hadn't mentioned is binos obviously you need good binos yeah i uh, like small binos yeah eight powers yeah they just way less again weight um so let's go into the hunt itself mm -hmm. like so that's as far as like preparation goes like the actual hunt um i think a, like the first thing because i'm just looking at the notes i put up here is uh expectations you know wh what to expect when you go out there and and how to react to it um and i say that and i know i've probably mentioned this briefly on here before but i know a common mistake that i hear all the time Primo's Takeout has changed the way that we hunt from minerals to feed to the seed that we plant our food plots with it has been incredible Head on over to primos.com now to check it out and receive free shipping on orders at $75 or more. Especially for someone who's going out there for the first time. You show up out there and you just, whether you just don't know any better or you've just seen enough elk TV episodes, you just kind of expect when you get there the elk to be just full-blown rutting. Yeah just going crazy bugling running into cow calls yeah i mean if you're going on a, a guided hunt with a outfitter or whatever they should have tabs on where the elk are and what they're doing and know how to hunt them you know mm -hmm. but we're speaking just like the average joe we're i mean we don't have guides on the place we hunt mm -mm. we go out there not being there all summer just having to find them yep and that's a lot i mean a lot of people don't realize that's what we do correct i mean and we, uh you you kind of have to it's best practice I've learned to go out there and take the time to gauge where the elk are at. I mean, best case scenario, you won't. If I was going on a hunt and by myself and public land, southern Colorado or New Mexico, I want ten days at least. Yeah. Because it's not. I mean, it can happen on the first day, but more than likely you got to figure out where they're at and how to hunt them before mm -hmm. you can actually hunt them. Yeah, and that's a. You have to figure out where they're at. And then, like you said, I, I would take, I would want that long of a time span 
if not longer. I would take as long as I could get. Yeah. I mean, if I could take off work a month and stay out there with no repercussions for being gone, you know, mm-hmm. I would. Mm-hmm. It, I'd take every day you can to be in the woods, even if you're not hunting them. Because this walks right hand in hand with, with going out there and not figuring out where they are, is you need to take a day two maybe three just scout yeah and figure out because a lot man a lot of these areas even in the big timbered mountains of colorado you can get on one side of them ridges and see all the way across and see down in the timber where the elk are Mm -hmm. just about getting in that right spot where you can watch and again it's it's a thing i hear it all the time you show up there and they they don't want to waste time scouting this is their one chance the first time they've been able to do it they don't know if they'll get the chance again so they just want to go i mean you may walk up there to go scouting one afternoon and there's a bull in the perfect spot to hunt and there it is you know but you wouldn't knew knew that if you hadn't walked up there going to scout Mm -hmm. and like by, by all means like take your bow oh yeah but if you're in a spot where there's a lot of open ground get to a good glassing spot glass yeah figure it out well for instance two years ago this was the year you were bow hunting mm-hmm. me and you drove out there two days for everybody else because will and brad and troy they were all in montana. montana yep so we drove out there we were bored here anyway done got done planting food plots and mm-hmm. we're like we got to go so we drove out there and spent two solid days we could have been hunting the season was open yeah and we spent two solid days figuring out where all the elk were because we had four tags that year mm-hmm. for bow hunters and we had to figure out where enough elk were, just not for one, but for four people to right. hunt. And through doing that, that was able to, when everyone got there and we started hunting, we were in the game immediately. Yep, we need to go here, here, here. Yeah. And three days later, we because, were done. Because it's it's an, it's an oddity, man. Usually, like I said, there, there's a couple of key places where they usually hang out, but the one spot where there's usually the highest concentration of elk they weren't there that year yeah there was some elk there but that's not where the most of them were the big majority was over there by the espia mm-hmm. and if we wouldn't have had those two days to find them we would have spent another two days when we were supposed to be trying to hunt trying to find them mm-hmm. so that's a that's a good tip like i said i know when you get out there you're ready to go 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 but take the time yeah to figure it out not just in not just in where the elk are but don't start out just blowing through the woods blowing the reed out your calls yeah i mean if you are in an area where you can watch them you can figure out what the rut's doing mm-hmm. if For you're sure. seeing a bunch of cows by themselves and bulls by themselves it's not happening because especially like if uh you know if you break day or whatever it, they kind of act a lot like turkeys do yeah you know the, if if it's early you know so you'll in the morning you'll hear some bugling and then it kind of cuts off yeah. then you you know like all right it's it's not they're kind of there they're getting there but you know it's it's again relating it to turkeys but like you know when it's full blown february turkey gobble yeah when it's full blown that bugling doesn't stop you know they're out they're out all day bugling you know doing the rut thing so that's something to pay attention to and our usual practice even on places like this place that we've hunted for years we kind of know the timing when to be out there Mm -hmm. but we still approach it from a calling standpoint with caution Mm -hmm. we don't just go out there just crazy aggressive speaking on this let's talk on dates because a lot of people i thought it before i started really learning how to elk hunt first week of september is like the peak ruts what i've always kind of watched Uh on tv and kind of picked up like you soon as september happens the elk are going nuts yep that's not the case not by any means yeah i mean that on the place we're hunting this third week of september is when it's right yeah you go out there september the 5th you may not see any rutting activity Mm -hmm. the same way goes anywhere seems like i mean southern colorado at the place y'all have hunted so much it's the same way y'all went too early last year yeah and i mean it it was starting but it wasn't full bore like we'd seen it in the past Mm -hmm. so yeah i can't put enough emphasis on that and again I, i can't speak to everywhere a lot of that may be region specific there may be some places where they are going full bore the first september i don't know but based off where we've hunted based off where we've hunted but your best practice is going to go in there and just take caution and figure it out that's going to put you in a much better spot Mm -hmm. to kill an elk if you just take the time to figure that stuff out first and it progresses so fast in elk the rut it does i mean 
you may if you've got 10 days or two weeks to hunt it may not it may not be to the last three days you hunt when they're going nuts yeah you know it hap- it's like a light switch man so don't give up yeah we've seen it before we've seen it before at the place in new mexico we've seen it where the ru- i mean they're rutting but it's not full crazy and then we come in there the next day mm-hmm. and it's they're going nuts that happened last year it did it, no it, ta- it takes a day yeah you just got to be there when it happens and lord willing everyone that listens to this that goes elk hunting that happens to them i hope it does mm-hmm. but on the off chance that it doesn't you gotta you gotta play your cards right yeah you know you gotta you got you can't make an elk be in rut you know yeah. you gotta hunt him at the stage that he's in yeah and you go out there and they're not doing what you expect adapt yeah adapt i mean they one thing's about an elk that i do know is a fact they have to have water mm-hmm. them suckers drink a lot too Mm-hmm. they visit water holes especially if you're in like new mexico where we hunt where it only rains you know 25 inches a year or whatever it right. is they uh they use those water holes a lot yeah they have to mm-hmm. so I mean, that's that's one thing you can start with google earth find your water holes yeah that's the spot to start looking for elk sign yeah for sure um one thing like i know primarily on here like i'm having um we're going to in a, in a few episodes from now i don't know exactly when it's going to be we're going to do one specifically on like uh not but we're going to talk a lot about solo elk hunting mm-hmm. that's a different animal uh all on its own not like a different animal it's still an elk but it's, you know what i mean yeah uh we do we hunt in groups yeah so and, and a lot of people do that they go out with their i don't know there's a lot more people that go with either them and a buddy or them and two or three other people then just go out by themselves. Yeah. If I mean, and that's the thing that you can do if that's your thing. You know, hang on a few more episodes. We'll talk about that more. And just my opinion, if you and a buddy both draw tags, I would highly recommend y'all take turns shooting. Exactly. You got a caller and a shooter at all times because mm-hmm. calling behind the hunter makes hundred percent difference. Seems like. Yeah, we're on the same wavelength because that's right where I was about yeah. to go to. Um, if you watch the show on outdoor channel or if you watch the episodes on youtube you've heard us say that a thousand times but yeah i mean we've had times in new mexico where we've had two or three guys sitting at the camp or one guy sitting at the camp i should say because he doesn't have a collar right and there's no sense you know or two guys could be a camera guy and a hunter right and we just know how much better it works having a collar yeah it works it's 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 night and day mm-hmm. so uh, and that's that's a rolls right into that thing with like common mistakes or, or common ways you kind of put yourself at a disadvantage i know if you both have tags both that both everybody wants to hunt i get that yeah but i think you increase your odds by so much if you put a shooter in a collar mm-hmm. i don't say i don't think i know because i've seen it yeah i've seen how well it works just getting a shot off yeah just getting a shot so and you uh, can call a elk up no problem with by being by yourself but trying to get him broadside at 30 yards is a whole different ball game correct correct so when you have a caller dropping usually 70 to 100 yards back even further than that if you need to yeah it just makes it that much better that elk's com- going to them and that allows him to come by you at broadside. Yeah, and, and this, the kind of the how we set it up uh, can, I guess, be kind of hard to picture uh, just listening to us talk audio-wise. But, again, Primo's YouTube channel, that how-to playlist, there's a, a video where Wilbur is explaining the, mm-hmm. the, the whole process of a drop-back caller and how well it works yeah. and all the different facets of it those videos have helped me when we were videoing them they were helping me yeah my you know? my, my buddy uh cory that's going on his first elk hunt this year he's I, he's like where can i go i direct him that youtube channel mm-hmm. that that that, the, that playlist and he's been watching it it's it's not it's not a bunch of fluff i mean it's what you need it's, it's what we do it's what again how long has wilbur been elk hunting wilbur and brad longer than i've been alive he knows <laughs> he knows what to do and like that he's who i learned from you know so he there's a lot of good information there um so yeah the calling obviously is a huge aspect um let's talk about that's that you know i th- we've leaned a lot real heavy on just like the things that you need to get the job done mm-hmm. uh looking back at a first elk hunt or you know maybe you're still new to it but you haven't got a chance to to kill one yet or even get a shot at one yet 
there's a lot for me, and we talked about this before we started recording, there's a lot of mental preparation. No doubt. I don't care if that sounds goofy. It's it's for, for real. I've been, uh, every time I start thinking about going hunting this year, the first thing that comes in my mind is don't screw it up. <laughs> don't make a bad shot. Yeah. And I haven't shot yet. You know, I hadn't shot the animal. But Mm -hmm. in my mind, I feel like I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very possible it could happen. Yeah. But I've just been preaching to myself, I've got to take my time. Don't rush a shot. Just make sure you shoot that animal just like you do at the range. Yeah. Don't take a shot at a bad angle. Yeah. Don't do it. It's very risky in elk. Don't do it. It's risky at anything, but elk more so even even if like beside you know like the point of you wanting to kill an elk it's it's the game that we play the sport that we do hunting however you want to whatever however you want to articulate it i think brad said it before i believe it 100 percent. you owe it to the animal you're pursuing yeah to make the best shot possible no one if i were to shoot an elk a turkey a deer whatever shoot i don't want to shoot it bad yeah. I want to make the most ethical, best place shot I can, kill him quickly. It makes the whole process easier. And so a lot of that happens, honestly, with all the practice and all the stuff we told you before, but a lot, I, I lean a lot on good, just mental preparation. Yeah. Same, I mean, turkeys even, you know? Yeah. Just, yeah. I lean a lot on good, on mental preparation. Honestly, because again, I was thinking, I remember when I was getting ready. One, I was I was shooting a lot. I think come like June or July, I was at least shooting every day. Yeah. And then when uh, like around mid August, I was shooting twice a day, every morning and every afternoon. Yeah. Just because I wanted, like I said, I, I wanted to. When you when you shoot that much, uh, it's all muscle memory. Exactly. You know, a, a lot of people say, you know, because you're like, man, when I'm when all that's happening, you're not thinking about draw cycle anchor this that the other. I'm like, no, you're not. But you get to the point where you practice so much where you do it without thinking about it. It's no different than playing baseball. These guys that are major league baseball players that can hit all these home runs and everything, you take them out of that game and don't let them swing a bat for a year, Yeah, they're not going to do that as soon as they first go right back to it. Correct. Yeah, there's got to be like practice involved. And so I, I tie that in the practice with mental preparation because you practice so much where you don't have to think about it yeah. and you're confident in what you can do. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've shot so much where my my muscles have the memory. When I draw back now and actually look at my peep, it's sitting on where I want to shoot. Right. Just from the muscle memory. Right. Not any any skill I have. It's just from muscles just, getting so used to doing it. Just from repetition. Yeah. Um, I know a thing that I did because I was thinking, I was like, man, I've bow hunted whitetails. You know, I've done that for years. And I, and I know what that sensation is like when I see a, a buck coming in, you mm-hmm. know. And so I kind of know how to deal with that because I've done it before. But I was like, man, I, I was having all these, like, thoughts go through my head. I was like, what if, like, the moment of truth happening, the elk coming in, and I just fall apart? Yeah. You know, I mean, just stuff like that just rolling through my head. I was like, I don't want to just, like, freak out and shoot five foot over the elk. You know? You, you, what do you, you know? Or shoot him in the gut. Shoot him in the gut. Shoot That's him in the shoulder. Worse. Yeah. I'd much rather just shoot one in the top of the horns than I had in the gut. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and so – I just started thinking about, you know, how, you know, things I could do to to alleviate that or things I could do to make sure that that didn't happen, yeah. you know. Uh, and one thing that I did, albeit goofy or whatever, I was, like, trying to simulate because everyone's different. Mm-hmm. You know, I, you and I have done it, I guess, through, through filming people. You, you get to a lot of times either go or film a person that's that's new to it or whatever, and sometimes – when something's happening, people just like their adrenaline kicks in big time and their heart just goes crazy and they just kind of can't hold it together. Yeah. Um, typically, and like I said, I don't, I don't know if I'm just built this way or whatever. Typically I'm, I'm pretty calm until after the shot and then I lose all consciousness. You know that <laughs> you've seen me, you've seen me do it. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't know I'd never been there when an elk was coming in. And so what I did Again, it may sound goofy, like just picturing me doing this would probably make you laugh. But like, there's a like my driveway's got an incline to it. I had my bow out there and my target. I would sprint to the top of the hill, sprint back down, get my heart racing really, really fast, and then I would shoot. 
Mm-hmm. Just because, like, that was the yeah. closest thing I could do to a heart pounding situation where I'm all, you know, jacked up and everything, you know, tensed up, and then see if I could still shoot while wearing a pink tutu. Yes, that was very. <laughs> 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 no, that makes sense, though. I mean, it, it definitely. I mean, I know shooting whitetails with a bow. Golly, my heart gets a thumping, but. I've been able to hold it together here recently. Mm-hmm. Not so much when I was a teenager, or I mean, I would lose it. There's not. If I had every buck I shot at with my bow when I was a teenager, especially <laughs> hunting in Illinois, <laughs> I would have a trophy room like crazy. But all I got stories to tell them about how I messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a mental game for sure, no doubt. I mean, I I would think making that shot mentally is one of the biggest things about elk hunting. Yeah, I hadn't experienced it yet, but based off shooting whitetails pigs whatever with a bow it's mental mm-hmm. uh, i mean you can do all the sit-ups running whatever you want to do shooting your bow if you can't hold it together when the animal's coming in you might as well not do any yeah. of it so uh, again i lean on strongly just taking the time to like mentally prep about it think mm-hmm. about it think about it and i mean just I mean, elk hunting's a mental game anyway. You got to be oh, steady yeah. telling yourself to keep on making another step after step. Yeah. Once you get that day over with and you've done 15 miles uphill all the way. Yeah. I think it was, guys, this is no kidding. Um, like, uh, it was either last year or the year before that we did it. We kept like a, uh, someone had one of those trackers or whatever. I don't know. We averaged over like 10 or 11 miles a day, averaged. Yeah. And that wasn't really going hard at it. No, that was that was and that was the average for like I don't know, nine days. Yeah. So yeah, it it's uh so yeah, mental mental preparation. And it, it again, I don't care how goofy it sounds, just think about it. Like think think yeah. about it. Picture it in your head, what's gonna go down and then have practiced enough and have enough confidence in your shooting and your bow and everything that you're completely confident in what you can do. That plays a mm-hmm. huge role. A there's, huge, huge role. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, and, and it's a, a all of that will pay off. It's a lot of work, but it all pays off, and, and I think all of it's necessary. I, I, to my knowledge, I don't think we've l- mentioned anything so far that everything we've talked about I would say is pretty essential. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I think about we didn't cover is bring some uh, lifting gloves so you can do pull-ups on a tree limb. <laughs> Right. We'll mark that as the one unnecessary <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a, it's a big undertaking. It's a I mean you have to be disciplined, um, but it's 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 a it's a beautiful thing when it all comes together. Yeah, man, I'm looking. I am so. It's, I still don't believe it's happening. I'm ready to see it happen for you. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm not so sure it's happening. I think I'm living in a, yeah. a fairy tale world. Because I, I can, re- like, I'm telling you, I mean, like, there's some hunts, like, I can remember dang near all of them, but some of them, it's like I can remember dang near every detail. Yeah. And that hunt with, with my first bow, bull elk, I can remember every single part. I can, too. <laughs> I can remember the first time I saw his antlers coming down. I can remember, I, I can remember walk all the walking it took to get us to that spot. I, I remember all of it. I just hope whoever's sitting behind me filming, whether it's you or Troy, is telling me to keep it calm, keep it calm, keep it calm. Yeah, that helps. Yeah, it helps big time when you got somebody behind you telling you, to, "Okay, just settle down." Yeah, it's it's a big part because it. I mean, and, it, and I guess again we have an advantage at that point because if you're hunting with two guys, you you know. Yeah. More than likely your guys going to be dropped back behind you, but you just got to keep you cool and let it happen. Yeah. And here's I guess I'm a, I'm going to lean in on this again. If it's the one chance the elk comes in and he doesn't give you a shot the entire the whole time, don't just fling an arrow at him. Yeah, you may get lucky and kill him, but it's a high percentage you're not. Yeah. Are you going to make him suffer and he's going to go off and die somewhere and he's not going to benefit anybody but a coyote? Yeah, I, I may – there may be some folks that disagree with, us, disagree with us on that, but I just don't believe in it. Yeah. And that you wait – and that, that you wait until you get that perfect shot because, like, Brad – Brad's been doing it forever too. Yeah. And uh, his – as far as, like, his confidence and his mental preparation, like, he's – pretty confident when that elk comes in you you will not see brad take a risky shot yeah. and you ask him and it, it sounds obvious but he says it so 
so confidently that you kind of get where he's coming from. You, someone was asking him, I heard, they said, when do you, you know, when did you decide to shoot there? He said, he said, I shoot when I'm a hundred percent sure that I can kill that elk. Well, because it when I know I can slam dunk him. Correct. He said, slam dunk him. If, if look, man, here's, and if, if the elk comes in and he's like at 47 yards and you draw back and you don't feel good about it, don't shoot. Yeah. Don't shoot. It's not Even worth it. You may have thousands of dollars tied up in this hunt. There, elk hunting is not cheap. Mm-mm. I mean, I'm not going to say it is. Even a do-it-yourself public land it's hunt is going to cost you some you dollars. Some, yeah. yeah, it's going to cost you thousand dollars or so. Even I mean, I don't put no a number on it, but it's going to be well over five hundred. I guarantee you that. But I would, I would much rather say one came in and i never took a shot at him and say i flung one hit him bad and didn't kill him yeah i mean you've got five hundred dollars invested in a tag yeah you know it's easy just, to me it's just it's just not worth it but yep. yeah it, it's a uh, it's a lot but it, it's doable if you if you approach it the right way i think no doubt um anything else that you would like to add i feel like we've covered a pretty good bit this prayer is from everybody that i make a good shot <laughs> I prayed a lot. Yeah. I said, Lord, please let this all come together, you know. Um, yeah, I think we've covered just about everything. Uh, last few things, um, guys, again, hit up that YouTube channel, the How to Elk Hunt, and then the Elk, Hunt, the elk product videos. Uh, I'll steer you a lot of the uh, – will steer you in the right direction. Go to the Primo's website, check out the Ultimate Elk Checklist. There's literally everything on there that you could ever need. If you have any questions, check that out. Uh, arrows, broadheads, go to the Gold Tip YouTube channel. There's tons of resources there. And, uh, yeah, I hope you, you t- learned a lot from this episode. Again, me and Jordan, we're still very new to it. We're still learning. We're coming at this and, and telling you all this stuff that we have learned and still learning. And I, and I hope you, you know, perceived it that way. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so yeah, that's it. We're done. If you have any questions, as always, send them into the Facebook or the Instagram page. Check out all those websites we told you about. And yeah, as always, thank you for listening to the Speak the Language podcast. And God bless. <laughs>